So hello everyone, uh, this is a new series of videos that we are going to do and uh, they're called Inside the Black Box. Uh, the reason we call them that is in black box uh, is an engineering term that basically means a thing which just works and you don't really care why it works, right? So for example, a graphics card is just a black box if you're building a PC because hey, as long as it works and you plug it in, you don't care how. Uh, but sometimes it can be interesting to kind of break into a black box and understand how it works. So what we're going to do in these videos is we're going to take apart some of the more common retro technology from gaming, things like the classic Atari 2600 joystick and have a look and see how they work. Uh, and hopefully that'll be something interesting. So this is a uh, Atari 2600 joystick. I believe the part number for this was the CX26. Uh, this is actually a reproduction. It's not the real one. This one ships with the flashback two. Uh, so I'm going to be causing no abuse to an original machine. So on the outside, really what it is, is it's got a single stick which has got four directions. Uh, it's possible to do, as you probably know, you can press a diagonal uh, and then it's got a single fire button. Uh, so what's interesting about this from a kind of technical point of view is um, the connections that it makes back to the machine, right? Um, and what's interesting about this particular device is that the design is actually kind of incredibly elegant and simple and because of that the interface that this thing implements uh, was used by a huge number of retro machines so um, most of the Atari 8-bit machines used it uh, Commodore used that in their 64, VIC-20, 128 and even the Amiga series um, and you could even buy a add-on device for the ZX Spectrum called the Kempston joystick adapter which would basically you plug the Kempston into the back in the expansion port and then we'll let you plug in one of these. And there's a bunch of machines that use the CX26. It was really, really popular. And we're going to see hopefully why. So the first thing to notice when you look at this uh, joystick is the plug. So if you look at the plug close up, you'll see that it's got nine pins. So there's five on top and then four at the bottom, right? Uh, this form factor for a plug is actually a standard device. It wasn't invented by Atari. It's called uh, Mini DB9. Um, so you can buy these things even today they get used for a bunch of devices so here's one that i bought um, you kind of buy them and they've got little cups at the back that you can solder cables onto and then you know you can plug them in hey presto right so these are very much standard connectors so that's already one thing that this joystick had going for it come on um, atari was using standard tech they didn't have to spend any money designing a new plug which is different to what for example nintendo did um, so <clears throat> what's interesting about these nine pins is that this particular device, or uh, sorry, not this device, but the Atari into which this plugged, um, needed the five switches, which this thing has, right? Because one for up, one for down, one for left, one for right, and the five button, that's five switches. But then it also needed two additional, uh, connectors for doing the paddles, right? Because if you remember the paddle wheel, in an Atari was uh, you had two paddle wheels that plugged into one socket, right? And uh, so you had, um, you needed two pins here to support the left paddle wheel and one for the right paddle wheel, right? Um, so when we open this up now, you'll see where all these connectors end up. And what they use is a very simple technology. So it's got uh, four screws at the bottom. Just don't screw these, they're just regular Phillips screws. Nothing fancy about them. Okay, oh, there goes one. Okay, it's starting to come apart. Nope, this one's still stuck. There we go, okay. All right, so let's pull this apart. And there we go, okay. So internally what you have is this kind of PC board hidden under here and you can see these are the uh, cables that go through. So let's quickly stop and count these. So what we have here is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six cables that are going through. Now, why only six cables and not a total of nine, which is what exists on the plug? And the reason for that is to do what this joystick needs to do, we only need six, right? You need one for up, one for down, one for left, one for right, and one for fire, that's five. Plus you need a sixth one for ground, right? Because whenever you have an electrical circuit, you've got to have a place for the current to begin and then a ground where the current ends up. So I'm gonna just pop this off. There we go, put that aside. And let's take this apart, and this is where it starts to get really interesting. And so you have to think about uh, historically where this joystick was. 
uh, if this ran on the 2600, you would be thinking about a design that was done in 1977, 78, somewhere around there, probably earlier than that. Uh, so uh, you can forget about having things like, you know, microchips, etc., inside because they were extremely expensive in those days. All right, so let's pop this guy off. Oh, there we go. So inside what we have is, uh, put that back. So this is actually only found in the repro version, uh, this rubber sheet. Um, uh, this is a technology, this conductive rubber, that actually only started really appearing in consumer electronics around the 80s. And when we, in a later episode, have a look at the Nintendo controller, uh, you'll see how that started appearing there. But the magic part is uh, not so much that, but what exists here. So all that you have here is incredibly simple, right? What you have here is a set of switches, and they're actually labeled here nicely, fire, up, down, left, right. And you can see that you've got these little kind of golden pads. And what these do is half of the pad is connected to one of the cables. So for example, this bottom right one is called down. So the down one roots up to here, and then the other half goes to ground. So if we follow right up, we've got ground over there. And so what you do when you press the direction or the button is you essentially close the switch and the uh, Atari is sensing for that signal, and that's how uh, it does the, the motion of a character on the screen, right? So it's incredibly simple. You have one switch per direction, uh, one switch for the fire button, and that's it. Um, so if you want to know exactly what, uh, how these map onto here, you can go onto the internet, of course, the magical interwebs. You can download a diagram that looks like this. This is called a pinout. Uh, and here you've got the five on top and on bottom, and you can see here. So. And this is up, down, left, right. So in other words, up, down, left, right. Um, five is for pot A1. So this would have been used for one of the paddles. Uh, six would have been used for uh, button A. So this is the trigger, the fire button. Seven is for plus five volts. So uh, the joystick doesn't require plus five volts flowing into it, but the paddle wheels do. Um, and then we've got eight is ground and nine is for the other paddle wheel. And what's interesting is on the Commodore 64, uh, you could get a mouse, right, as part of the DOS operating system, for example, supported that. Uh, and they used, uh, because they used this exact same uh, plug layout, uh, the, the mouse on the Commodore 64 used uh, these two pins, the, essentially the paddle controllers, for doing the X and Y motion on the mouse. Uh, so that's all there is to a Atari 2600 joystick. It's essentially five switches uh, plugged through a DB9, uh, pin and all of the work is done by the Atari itself. Uh, it has to at every moment essentially be looking out hey is the up down pushed is the down pushed is the left push and so on and that's how you do the motion. So I hope you enjoyed that look inside an Atari 2600 joystick. Uh, I'll try and put this guy back together so we can get him working again. Um, and next time we are going to tear apart a Nintendo NES controller which uses a very different scheme and we can compare and see how that technology works. So thanks for watching. See you soon. Thank you.